Welcome to the Chapter 6, Part 1 lecture. You should use the information in this lecture to complete the Chapter 6, Part 1 notes, which you should complete before you attend class. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about cells and how they're put together. So in this part of the lecture, we're going to define what cells are, talk about cell theory, talk about the different kinds of cells that exist, and then we're going to get into cell structures. We'll start with the prokaryotic cell structures, and then we'll begin talking about the eukaryotic cell structures, specifically the non-membranous ones. We'll save the membranous structures for the next lecture. We are now six chapters into a biology course, and we are finally, finally talking about something that's alive. Up till now, we've been talking about molecules, and molecules are, of course, the building blocks of life, but they are not themselves alive. Cells, on the other hand, are the smallest units of life. They are the structural and functional units of living things. Now, there are many, many different kinds of cells, and we'll get into some of those. Um, there's a nice big amoeba there, for instance, and there are over 200 different types of cells that exist in the human system. So there's a lot of variation just on the cellular level. In this lecture, we're going to discuss what we call the generalized cell. So it has all the potential parts that a cell can have, and it doesn't have any particular function. But remember that uh, this can vary depending on the type of cell that you're talking about. In general, cells are too small to be seen with the naked eye. They are really, really tiny. Most cells range in size from 100 micrometers down to one micrometer. And I'll remind you that a micrometer is a millionth of a meter. So again, too small to see. There are some exceptions to this. There are cells, for instance, in your nervous system called neurons. And some of those guys are stretched out really, really long. They might extend from your lower back all the way down to your toes. So those cells can be about a meter in length, but they're still really, really fine and hard to see. There are cells that are smaller as well. Some of the smallest known bacteria are only 100 nanometers in size. And I'll remind you that a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, far too small to see with the naked eye and even difficult to see with a microscope. So even though all cells are really tiny, they can vary in size quite a bit. Think about this. The average cell in one of our bodies can be hundreds or even thousands of times larger than the average bacterial cell. That's like comparing an insect to an elephant. The cell theory is a collection of ideas that scientists know to be true about cells. It has three major points. First, that every living organism consists of one or more cells. Having cells is one of those characteristics that something has to have in order for it to be considered alive in biology, and we talked about that back in chapter one. Second, cells are the smallest units of life and are the structural and functional units of life. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you study the structures inside this cell and you figure out what they do, that's going to give you a clue as to how that cell functions. And if you extend that, that can help you figure out how the entire organ or organism functions. So structure relates to function. Third, all existing cells come from pre-existing cells, or came from pre-existing cells. So what that tells me is that if this cell exists, I know it exists because another cell decided to divide. Cells come from reproduction, called division, not from something called spontaneous generation. Even though many, many different kinds of cells exist, all of these cells have certain things in common. In other words, they all have certain structures that they have to have in order to stay alive. First, all cells have a membrane. Um, cell membrane is this kind of skin on the outside. It separates the outer environment from the inner environment, and it helps the cell decide what can come in and what goes out. Second, all cells have genetic material. 
DNA and RNA. Now in this case, the DNA is inside this big structure called a nucleus. Not all cells have a nucleus, but they all have DNA. Third, cells have proteins and ribosomes. Proteins are a little bit too small to see for the most part, but these little tiny dots in here that look like sprinkles, those are ribosomes. Proteins, if you remember, do all the different jobs of the cell. So they transport things, they make reactions happen, etc. They're like the little people, the little workers inside the cell. Ribosomes are in charge of making proteins. So in order to have proteins, you have to have ribosomes. And all cells have those. Fourth, all cells have cytoplasm. It's a little difficult to point out, but this jelly-like stuff in here, this kind of watery substance in here, that's cytoplasm. And it fills the inside of a cell. All cells have it. Finally, all cells have to have methods for obtaining energy. Now there are many different chemical reactions that cells can use to get energy. In this case, this cell is mainly going to rely on something called cellular respiration, which happens inside this organelle known as a mitochondrion. But plant cells can photosynthesize, that's part of how they get energy. Other cells can break down things um, like methane and sulfur compounds for energy. It just depends. But they all have to get energy from somewhere. Cells can be placed in one of two different categories, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. What makes them different from one another? Well, we'll discuss the subtle differences later, but here are the big ones. As, in chapter, as you learned in chapter one, prokaryotic cells make up the domains archaea and bacteria, whereas eukaryotic cells make up the domain eukarya. In general, prokaryotic cells are much smaller and less complex than eukaryotic cells. And again, the difference in size and complexity can be a factor of hundreds or even thousands. Now notice that inside the eukaryotic cell, you've got these packets. Here's a packet that's called a nucleus. You've got all this wavy stuff here. Here's a little packet. Those things are called membrane-bound organelles. So these are pieces of plasma membrane that have been folded around and that compartmentalizes the cell. It makes little cubicles or little areas where they can perform separate chemical reactions. It kind of organizes the cell. Eukaryotic cells have them. Prokaryotic cells do not. If you look inside here, you'll notice that this purpley stuff, the DNA, is not inside a nice package. It's not inside a nucleus. And that all the other stuff is kind of just floating around in the cytoplasm, kind of all mixed together. So prokaryotic cells, no membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic do have membrane-bound organelles. Let's discuss prokaryotic cells in a little bit more detail. Now even though prokaryotic cells are quite a bit smaller and less complex than eukaryotic cells, they are extremely flexible and extremely adaptable. And so that's the reason that these guys have been around on the planet for over 3 billion years. They deserve a lot of respect. Let's discuss some of these structures we find inside. First of all, you'll notice that they don't have a nucleus, so there's not a compartment around this purpley looking DNA, but they do kind of crunch it together in an area that we call the nucleoid. So that's just where the DNA can be found. Now the DNA is stored a little differently in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, there are many long pieces of DNA called chromosomes. But in prokaryotic cells, there's a single chromosome called the bacterial chromosome, and it's going to be looped together in kind of a circle. Here that circle is kind of collapsed, so it's a little hard to tell that it's a circle. There are also other little pieces of DNA that can be found inside prokaryotic cells known as plasmids. Plasmids are little bitty circles of DNA. Now the interesting thing about prokaryotic cells is that they can pick up these little pieces of DNA from their environment, or they can even, even swap them with other cells. So that allows them to pick up new genes and to create genetic in variation in their populations. They can even pick up new abilities by picking up these little plasmid DNA pieces. That's something called horizontal gene transfer that we'll talk about in a later chapter. By the way, this diagram is from your textbook and will be on the next test.
you should know the parts of this diagram and you should know the functions of those parts. There are several interesting structures that can be found on the outside of a prokaryotic cell. First of all, we have the plasma membrane. Now all cells have a plasma membrane, so that's not particularly unique. But here you can see it's this kind of orangey layer on the inside here. There are some other things that exist outside the plasma membrane. One of those is the cell wall. A cell wall is a thick, dense structure just to the outside of that membrane. Let's see if I can trace it a little bit. It's represented in kind of white here, kind of there. It's really thick, it's protective, and it helps give the cell shape. Another interesting part you might find on a prokaryotic cell is something called a glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is this kind of outer layer out here on the very outside, and it's either going to consist of a slime coat or something called a capsule, which is yet another protective layer on the outside of that membrane. Many of these prokaryotic cells have several of these layers in combination, which is part of the reason that some of them, like staph, can be really hard to kill. Now I want you to look at these little squiggly things here. A lot of students mistake these for cilia. But these are not cilia because this is a prokaryotic cell. These little guys are called fimbriae. Fimbriae are little sticky hairs, and this is what helps this bacterium stick to other surfaces, like other cells, or maybe a surface in your kitchen, or the surface of your body. Now, if you ever take a microbiology course, you'll study prokaryotic cells till the cows come home. But I just wanted to take a moment and show you how cool and complex these cell walls can be in prokaryotic cells. Look at this guy. Here's its plasma membrane, like all cells have, and then this is the cell wall. It's made out of a chemical known as peptidoglycan, which is a mashup of protein, pep, and gly for carbohydrates. This guy has a cell wall made of several different layers that kind of work together. So the complexity of these cell walls is part of what helps uh, prokaryotic cells protect themselves, and again, it's part of what makes these guys really, really hard to kill. If you want to get rid of bacterial infections or control them, you have to know a lot about their cell walls and how they work. We're going to spend most of our time talking about eukaryotic cells and how they work. There's two major types of eukaryotic cells we're going to focus on, plants and animal cells. Now these are the parts that you might have been able to see under the microscope. Hopefully you were able to see those in lab four. But there are many, many other parts that make up these cells, and you need to know the structure of them and the function of them. You also need to be able to recognize them on diagrams. So I want you to notice these diagrams. These are from your textbook. There are labeled versions of them available in the textbook. And these will appear on your next test. So you need to find them in your textbook, you need to learn the parts of these diagrams, and know the functions of those parts. We'll go through them one part at a time. Next, let's talk about some of the structures we can find inside eukaryotic cells, the big complex guys. The eukaryotic organelles fall into two categories, membranous organelles and non-membranous organelles. Membranous or membraneous organelles have a membrane around the outside. So the nucleus is a good example of a membranous organelle. Here's the ER. It's just a long piece of membrane that's been folded back and forth. It's another membranous or membraneous organelle. Over here, on the other hand, we have a non-membranous organelle, a piece of cytoskeleton, something called a microtubule. And this thing doesn't necessarily have a membrane around it. It's just a long protein tube. In part one of this lecture, we're going to focus on the non-membranous organelles. Our first non-membranous organelle is the cell wall. The cell wall is literally a wall made out of carbohydrates that exists on the outside of the plasma membrane. So here you can see it in a plant cell, here you can see it in a fungal cell.
Now, not all cells have cell walls. Animal cells such as ours do not have them, but plant cells do, fungal cells do, and some of the protists have them too. They can be made out of different kinds of molecules. In plants, they're made out of cellulose, and in fungal cells, they're actually made out of chitin, the same carbohydrate you find in insect exoskeletons. Now the cell wall has a couple of important functions. It helps protect the cell. It also helps give the cell its shape. Remember that the plasma membrane is actually a liquid. It's not a solid, so it doesn't give it the shape. This wall gives the cell its shape. But the cell wall is not airtight. It has to have little pores in it, and that's going to allow things like water and oxygen to come in, and things like waste to go out. In other words, we say that the cell wall is permeable, which means it lets stuff in and out. So it's protective, but it is not air or water tight. This cytoskeleton is probably my favorite cellular organelle. Let me tell you why. The cytoskeleton is a series of these protein tubes. And there's several different kinds, which we'll talk about. But these tubes extend through the inside of the cell. They make kind of a highway system that travels all across here. And these tubes can grow and shrink. So it's like a flexible skeleton inside a cell. This is an image of a nerve cell under a fluorescent microscope. And what they've done here is they've attached the cytoskeleton to a protein known as GFP, or green fluorescence protein, so that any time the cell expressed this protein or used this protein, it would glow green. And so you can actually see the cytoskeleton inside of the cell. Normally the cytoskeleton's clear and you can't see it. But what you can see is that this, these tubes are making a scaffolding inside this cell, and again, kind of a highway system that spreads throughout the interior. And again, these tubes can grow and shrink. The cytoskeleton is a dynamic network of filamentous proteins that extends throughout the cytoplasm, forming the struts, cables, and girders that give the cell its shape, internal organization, and mechanical support for movement. There are several types of protein filament, each built from subunits that rapidly come together or break apart, allowing these elaborate structures to be assembled and dismantled wherever they are required by the cell. Microtubules are stiff, hollow tubes that anchor other organelles and serve as tracks that guide the movement of vesicles and other cell components. Actin are thin, flexible filaments that form cross-linked bundles and branching networks. Actin is particularly important for cell movement. They are central to the contractile engine in muscle cells and provide the mechanical force for cell movement at the plasma membrane. Now what can you do with a skeleton that can grow and shrink at will? Well, you can do lots of things. The cytoskeleton helps determine the cell shape. By making a scaffolding inside that liquidy plasma membrane, it helps determine what shape the cell is going to have. Some cells are able to swim using cilia and flagella, and those structures are also made out of these protein tubes. You can also move organelles and other things around inside the cell. Here, for instance, we see one of these giant protein tubes, and you can see that this blue ball, this thing's called a vesicle, is being hauled by this little guy and it's being hauled along this tube. So the tubes inside serve as kind of a highway system to transport things from one area to another. One of the most important things that gets transported during uh, cell division is the DNA. So when the cell is dividing, the chromosomes have to be hauled in the right direction, and it's cytoskeleton that allows this to happen. So you can do a lot of stuff with this flexible skeleton.
There are three different kinds of tubes found in the cytoskeleton, and they range from largest to smallest. Here we have the largest one, called a microtubule. Microtubules are these giant hollow tubes, and they're used in things like cilia and flagella, which help the cell swim around, if it's a cell that can do that. Second, we have intermediate filaments. They're the kind of medium-sized ones. And these guys are bundles of tubes. They're kind of like the giant cables you might find on a suspension bridge. Um, and these guys are used to anchor organelles in place. So not only can organelles move along these tubes, they can also grab on and hold on and stay in one place using the cytoskeleton. Finally, we have the smallest guys, these guys called microfilaments, also known as actin, and they're like tiny little twisted ropes of protein. These guys help give the cell its shape. They're also really, really important in muscle contraction. These are the proteins that kind of grab each other and pull and allow you to produce that force with your muscles. Several different important organelles are made out of cytoskeletal elements, so let's look at those next. This first guy is known as a centriole. Now centrioles are only active during cell division, so you don't see them all the time, but they are important. Centrioles are made of bundles of these little cytoskeletal elements set at almost a 90 degree angle to one another. Here you can see one in a dividing cell. Now what these things do is during division, these tubes will grow out and they form something called the spindle. And the spindle grabs these pieces of DNA and it hauls them to opposite ends of the cell. And this is what allows the cell to divide. So here we have a very, very busy drop of pond water as visualized under a light microscope. This, incidentally, is why you never, ever want to drink untreated water. It's because it's very, very likely very, very full of microorganisms like this. Now, these little guys are different kinds of protists. And if you remember, a protist is a eukaryotic type of cell with a nucleus that doesn't neatly fit into the animal, plant, or fungus category. So they're classified in different groups. Now, let me pause them for a moment because what I want you to see is that these guys are moving with different types of cytoskeletal elements. They're moving with different types of organelles. These big guys swim with cilia, and you'll notice that they move backwards and forwards with ease. These little guys down here are called euglena, and it's kind of, they're too small to see, but they do have a flagellum, and it allows them to move in one direction very quickly. If you look closely at them, you'll notice that they move with kind of a fishy motion, kind of a back and forth motion. Aren't these drops of water fascinating? Some of these little aquatic uh, ecosystems are as rich and diverse as a rainforest. You're seeing a whole little world in a drop of pond water.
The next cytoskeletal organelle is known as a cilium. Now you've probably heard of this referred to as a cilia, but cilia is technically plural. One of these things would be a cilium. If we look inside a cilium, you'll see that it is a bundle of these little cytoskeletal elements, and the plasma membrane kind of wraps around it. So it kind of pushes out of the side of the cell and makes this little hair that sticks out. Now what the cell can do is wave this little hair back and forth, and that helps move fluid around it, or if it has enough cilia, it can move the entire cell and allow it to swim. Now this cilium is a eukaryotic specialty. You find it in some animal cells. You find it in protists. That should be protists, not protests. Uh, but things like paramecia. And you'll definitely see some of these guys in lab. Here we have a paramecium swimming. And what I want you to notice is that the whole surface of this thing is covered with these little cilia that stick out. Now the cilia wave in a coordinated fashion, and that allows the paramecium to move forwards and backwards. Here we'll see them come into contact with a little piece of debris, and bump, oh, it can start swimming backwards. So cilia are a very flexible um, organelle, and it allows movement in many different directions. Here you can see some ciliated cells. Now some cells with cilia are able to swim, but no human cells are able to do that. However, we do have some cells that have cilia. Here for instance are some cells that might be found in your windpipe, in your trachea. So why do they have cilia? Well, it's a disgusting story. Your trachea is coated with mucus, and your body constantly produces this mucus. The mucus flows down towards your lungs, and these cilia, they wave together and they beat up. So they pull that mucus away from your lungs and into the back of the throat. Now why is mucus there? Well, it's sticky and it helps catch debris in the air that you breathe, and it helps prevent it from getting down in your lungs and causing obstructions and infections and stuff like that. So here's the even more disgusting part. As that mucus travels up into the back of your throat, what do you do? You swallow it. You swallow it all day long. It goes down into your stomach and the acid kills the dangerous stuff. So these cilia are there to help keep your lungs clean. Now if you smoke, one of the very first side effects of smoking is the paralysis of these cilia, and it can cause something known as smoker's cough. If you stop smoking, the function of these cilia can eventually come back, but it takes a while. It's not immediate. A flagellum is kind of like a cilium, except that whereas a cilium is a short little hair, a flagellum is more like a long tail. Now because that flagellum is so long, when the base of this bends back and forth, it actually makes the tip of this thing spin around. So this is kind of like an outboard motor on a cell, and it propels a cell forward. Now based on this diagram, you can guess which kind of human cell has a flagellum. There's only one kind, and it is the sperm cell. Other types of organisms have flagella as well, one or more. Flagella is plural. Um, eukaryotic cells have them. Prokaryotic cells and bacterial cells have them as well, although structurally they're different. They're put together a little differently. So how do these cilia and flagella wave back and forth like that? Well, to understand that, we need to look at them on the microscopic level. Here we can see the cytoskeletal elements themselves, the tubes, and if you look in between the tubes, you'll find these little guys. These little things that look like rubber bands are actually motor proteins. 
Now, instead of walking up and down the tubes like the motor proteins I showed you before, these guys stretch and they pull back and forth in the center of these tubes, and that's what makes them wave back and forth. So that's pretty cool. Here's a little closer view of the euglena we saw in a previous video. Now in the previous video they were swimming around. In this video, I'm going to be honest, they're a little bit drunk. You can see that they're moving very slowly, and that's because they've been given a chemical to slow them down so we can see them more easily. Now you'll notice that each one has a flagellum and it is whipping around in a circular motion. And when they haven't been drinking, this is what allows them to move forwards through the fluid. It propels them forward. To finish out your notes for part one of the chapter, I want you to do an activity that I call Cell City. I want you to imagine that a typical eukaryotic cell, like one of your body cells, is actually a city with little people inside. Now when you think about a city like Austin, it's got different parts that work together. There's a mailman, there's a mayor, there's a police force, there's buildings, there's streets, there's city limits, there's all that stuff. And it has to work together so that the city can function. A cell is the same way, so what I want you to do is to think about the parts we've talked about so far, like the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, and the cytoskeleton, and I want you to tell me in your own words what part they would represent in the city. If it helps, you can fill in this kind of a, a sentence. If the cell were a city, the cytoplasm would be the blank, and you can be creative here. This can be any kind of city you want. Bring your answers to class with you, we'll discuss them, we'll brainstorm them, and go from there.